Hello, this is Dean Radin, and I am on Your Superior Self. Hi, I'm Anita Marjani, and this is Your Superior Self. Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, cultural creatives. I'm Bruce Lipton, and I'm here to join you with Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Paul Selig, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. Hello, my name is Christopher Lee Maher, and this is Your Superior Self. Chris, my man. Thank you for taking the time to hang out with us today, fellow Philly guy, hanging out in the Your Superior Self conversation world. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, man, I'm so grateful to be here. And anything mm -hmm. that I have to share, um, um, I'm happy to share. Absolutely. Um, your story is very interesting. You've been on a very long and winding journey uh, in search of, I want to say, truth right? Mm -hmm. Healing, truth. But truth is, mm, it's a funny word with so many different meanings. And it's all subjective, I think, at the end of it. But um, I think all paths lead there. And uh, I'm interested in hearing how you <laughs> arrived at your location, my friend, um, started where, where I want to pick up at is right. Why the seals? Why the seal teams? You know, the thing about it for me is I was, how could we say, um, I was undervested in my life and I was just sort of hopping from one experience to the next. And when you've been in a boarding school for 10 years, so I went to Milton Hershey School in Hershey, Pennsylvania, um, you never had time to make your own decisions because every moment was monitored like every minute was accounted for so you wake up at 5 30 you're in barn by six barn ends at seven you shower from seven to seven fifteen from seven fifteen to seven thirty you eat breakfast from seven thirty to seven forty five you clean the dishes from 7:45 to 8 you get ready for school if you miss the van you then have to walk do you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. and then you go to school and the same thing happens. And when you come home, you're going through the same routine. Everything was so regimented. And when I looked at the front cover of this biannual magazine about SEAL training, it showed seven or eight boat crews running down the beach with telephone poles on their shoulder. And as soon as I said that, I heard this little voice in the back of my head go, you need that kind of challenge. These people are going to stretch you. And I thought, okay, whatever this is, I'm going for that. Mm -hmm. Did you say in the barn at 745? No, in the barn at six o'clock. Six o'clock. What, what is in the barn? I mean, I know in you're the in barn. The so at Milton Hershey School, we had 44 dairy farms. Mm -hmm. And so at each student home, there were 16 boys or 16 girls in the student home. And in the senior division, you part of your part of your training was to go to barn. So you were in barn for two weeks doing doing barn chores or you were doing house chores for two weeks. And every two weeks you flip spots. So and you're barn, literally in a barn. barn. Okay, I got you now. You're in Hershey, barn. Hershey PA. I get it. You're making Hershey PA you're getting milk for the chocolate. Yeah, that's right. Because what do they, what, well, what's their tagline? Milk chocolate, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they got to get the milk from somewhere. <laughs> and so we, the kids going to Milton Hershey school, then produce the milk. Wow. Free labor, huh? Yeah. Uh, no, oh yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> yes, they got free labor. Mm. And at the same time, they give us a good solid education, right? And what's very interesting is the kids that went to barn are the kids that come back from homecoming every year and the kids that never went to barn because they didn't have a lot of difficulty, like things to work through. They don't come back because they don't have the same value and appreciation that the hard work provided for them. Mm. And so when you're, you know, 13 years old and you're going to barn and you're lifting hay bales all morning, you know, you, there's a part of you that's like hating it. But then a part of you starts to learn after you go through that process for four years 
that it's necessary in order to learn to love things that you hate so that you can be okay with what is. Mm. And that experience taught me that. Mm. So that experience drove you to the Navy SEALs team. Like, that's very interesting. Did you go through one time, like one rotation? Did you One pass? rotation. So the way it works in SEAL training is uh, you show up, there's a bunch of guys coming in from the Navy. They've all passed the test. They group you into a class. So the first class I was in was called Bud's Class 182. Okay. Or no, Bud's Class 177. And that group goes through four phases of training. The first phase is pre-training, right? So you're getting up and you're getting fit. Every day you're swimming miles on end, you're running miles on end, you're doing a lot of physical calisthenics, pull-ups, push-ups, dips. They've got you running and moving all day long for like 12 or 14 weeks, that's it. And then once you get through that phase, they clash you up if you're proficient enough to go into what's called first phase. And in first phase, the big week in there is called hell week. And I think it's nine or 11 weeks or something. And a lot of guys don't make it up to hell week. And a majority of the guys don't make it through hell week because hell week, you're kept up mostly the entire time you're awake and they're pounding on you day and night with more exercise, more routine, because they need to find out is this the guy, is he going to make a good decision when he's cold, he's wet and he's miserable. Mm. And they need to find that out. So they got to put you, they got to get you cold and they got to make you miserable. Right. And when you're doing calisthenics uh, on the beach, there's sand that's getting down your shorts and you're doing sit-ups and you can feel the sand grinding away at your skin and you got to continue to keep doing these things, it kind it toughens you up in a way, right? To kind of get your mind beyond the physical limitations of discomfort. Hmm. How close were you to, did they ring the bell? Am, am I thinking of that right? Like when you ring the bell, when you quit? Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. Well, now they call it, they, when I was there, they changed the name of it. They called it DOR which was a uh, drop on request versus saying that a guy was a quitter because they under started to understand the emotional impact of that. Because I think there were guys that were leaving SEAL training that didn't graduate. They were going back into the Navy, into the fleet, and they were committing suicide. Mm. And so then they started to change the way that they did that because they knew that demeaning someone was probably not the best idea. If the guy's going to quit, let him quit respectfully. And basically you go up, you ring the bell, you take your hat off and you put it there. And then everyone every day that comes into the area where we do physical fitness, calisthenics, looks over and they see your hat. Because what happens is you start bonding with guys in your class and then you're at lunch and you're like, where's Smith at? And they're like, Smith quit, man. Hmm. And you're like, come on, Smith didn't quit. He's hardcore. And then you run into the place where you do um, physical exercise again. And then you see Smith's hat sitting there. You're like, okay, Smith quit. Mm -hmm. And I get it. I, I understand guys that didn't have difficult childhoods a lot of times or didn't have overbearing parents. When they get to SEAL training, they're thinking about the fantasy of becoming a Navy SEAL. But if your circumstances when you were being raised up didn't already give you sort of an edge, when you get to SEAL training, you find out really quickly that that's not the community for you. You get punched in the mouth real quick. Real quick. Like there's nothing like 53 degree water and being in there for a couple hours to get you frozen like an ice cube, to get you really to start to think about what do I really want to be doing with my life? And a lot of guys are coming in, look, they're 18, they're 19, they're 20 years old. They're wet behind the ears. They're living in a fantasy. Maybe they don't, they don't have a good, strong sense of themselves. 
And if you don't have a good, strong sense of yourself, when you go through SEAL training, they are going to expose the cracks in your foundation and your philosophy and your self-belief and your positive Mm self-reflection. And they're going to expose you and they expose you to pain and discomfort. And either you're going to stay and deal with that or you're going to leave. And look, the guys that left, good on them because they were clear that that is not for me. (laughs) Forget all this pain and discomfort. For me, that was a normal experience because of things that happened to me in my childhood when I was really young. What was that? Like, what, what were their things that prepared those, you for that? Yeah, those things are, I had a woman named Mrs. Baskerfield who was a babysitter. And um, I was born on the day that Robert Kennedy was shot. Okay, so there was a lot of hysteria in the field in, in the United States. And um, I was in Philadelphia at the time. And we lived in the neighborhood. We were in West Philly, literally right down the street from U of Penn. And at the time, you know, those, those were difficult times, right? You had, the assass- you had a lot of assassinations going on and the country was in turmoil. So from an energetic perspective, I was born into the consciousness of what was going on in 1968. And then the woman that was babysitting me while my mom was dealing with all of her mental breakdowns, uh, she decided the best way to teach me to not play with matches was to put my hands on a gas stove. And she gave me third degree burns, right? Which you can still see the burns today, Mm. right? This finger is like a tiny little finger. Um, You can see all the scarring in here, right? So I was getting skin grafts. I was going for operations for, from the time I was three and a half until the time that I was 12. What was she telling your mom? Like, what was she telling your mom that why were you getting these burns? Uh, what did she tell my mom? My mom took her life by the time she was 29. Oh, wow. She had a lot of guilt. I think she dealt with a lot of guilt and shame for what happened to me. And she dealt with her own, uh, stress and trauma from someone breaking her sexual boundaries when she was 12 years old. Hmm. And so she had a lot of internal turmoil. And so her ability to process things emotionally and trust those around her was very fragmented. Mm-hmm. So I'm being raised by a woman in that situation. Okay. And she's having a tough time. So those experiences prepared me to go through SEAL training because I, was all, I had already been burned right? Go on the opposite end of being burned. And you're talking about being frozen. And so if I could handle that in my nervous system as a young child to get to the point where I could make really good decisions for what I wanted to do with my life, I'm going to be able to handle the cold and the discomfort that they're going to pile on me every day in SEAL training. Do you think because you experienced so much physical pain, emotional pain at a young age that you were able to better disassociate yourself with the body. If that makes sense Um, to to kind of deal with that. I think it made it easy for me to be easier for me to be in my body and feel pain where when someone disassociates, it gets, they get more to what's called the depersonalized state where they move themselves out so they can't feel the pain, they can't feel the discomfort. I was inspired to feel more pain and more discomfort, which is why that community that, and that experience was more attractive to me. So the more pain, more pain that you could feel was the reward for you. What, yeah, it was the reward. It, it made me feel more alive. Hmm. And you, oh man, so that's, is that how you ended up in Hershey is because, um, yep, that's your, how I ended up mom, in Hershey. Yeah. Mom took her life and then you ended up in Hershey. Yep. Because, all right. So, 
Oh man. Did they provide you with any type of counseling services or, or mentoring programs for you know, the, your, yeah, your trauma? You know, it's very interesting. The truth is they didn't, they didn't take the, the, uh, the advantage of the opportunity to rehabilitate me because I don't think they really understood the effects on an emotional level. I don't think they understood the effects on an energetic level. And they did the best thing that they could do for me, which, which was give me routine, okay? And give me space. They gave me routine and they gave me space. So with all the, your experiences, right? When you're that young and you have, like you have a lot of uh, training in um, traditional Chinese medicine, yeah. knowing what you know now, looking back, when you're that young and, and you're experiencing that that much trauma, where does that stress go? That stress went into my muscles. Okay. It went into my muscles and it went into my fascia and it went into my bones and it went into my organs. So as I started to receive, because when you're going to school and you're studying Chinese medicine, Every Chinese medicine school has a clinic attached to it. And the clinic serves a purpose of allowing the kids uh, who are going through the program to be able to treat patients while being monitored by Chinese medical doctors, right? So what most people don't know is, is that if, if anyone in the world besides United States um, who is a licensed acupuncturist and can practice Chinese medicine has been to medical school first. Okay, so you have to go to a Western medical school to get the opportunity in other countries to be able to study Chinese medicine, right? The United States has a very intensive program. So they will allow you to go study traditional Chinese medicine without going to medical school because they provide Western education for you. So I went to school that was half Western and half Eastern. And so you have to learn all of the Western information while figuring out how to layer on top all of the Eastern philosophy. So when you look at a patient, when, when, when you look at somebody you're working with and serving, you get to see all of them rather than some of them. And what I mean is in, West, in Western philosophy, they're treating the symptom, okay? They're never going after the core issue. Mm -hmm. So when I started to get treated at the Chinese medicine clinic at school, it started to allow layers of stress to burn off, right? Because any experience you have, what's it gonna do? It's going to create an imprint in your nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. And because that becomes a normal state of being for you, you now are running neural pathways to continue to keep that feedback loop going. And then the key is when you're going to Chinese medicine, they're helping you create an interference button to that pattern that's running at an energetic and a subconscious level. Uh, and was it after SEAL, SEAL teams? Like after you graduated? Like how, to, so did you, how long did you get discharged there? Like how, how long? Yeah, yeah, did so, you... so I got out of that environment in 1997. And then I went back in the school thinking that I was gonna train for the Olympic trials. And then what happened is I had a body that continued to get injured again and again and again and again and again, because I was applying the strategies from SEAL training to training in track and field. And a high, how do we say this? A very sophisticated athlete, you can't beat on yourself for six hours a day and expect when it comes time to race to perform at a high level. You can beat on yourself for six times a day if you're preparing yourself to do a mission or an operation in the SEAL teams because that's what's required. And I wasn't able to make a sophisticated distinction that the way that I was going about it was I was always overtraining because I was thinking more is better. Mm -hmm. And so after getting injured again and again and again and again and again, I had the unfortunate or fortunate, depending on how you want to look at it, 
uh, opportunity to get in a very severe car accident that landed me in a hospital and in pain in the center of my hip that I could never get away from. And then I had to start to do something that was very difficult for me. I had to reach out and ask for help. Because, you know, when you're in SEAL training in the SEAL teams, you never complain. That's one thing you will find guys in the teams. They never, ever complain, bitch, or moan. You're there to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And we've been through enough training to be able to understand the importance of that, right? And so I lacked the ability, one, to identify that, one, I needed help, okay? Two, I was overdoing everything that I was doing. And three, I lacked the ability to actually ask for help. And then it got to the point where I had pain at you know, every single joint. And now I got no choice. So I reached out to one of my buddies and he said, hey, I'm gonna bring a yoga mat and a juicer over to your house. And he taught me some things and he got me on that holistic path because my Western choices weren't the ones that I wanted. Mm -hmm. I wasn't open to getting a hip replacement. I wasn't open to being on piles of medication. I knew consciously that if one day I felt great, well, there's got to be a way for me to feel great again. And if I'm being honest with you, I spent time crying. I spent time really frustrated. Okay. And I decided to take the holistic path. And then that is what led me eventually into Chinese medicine. That was the next eventual step because I went into everything. Feldenkrais, the Gosku method, acupuncture, acupressure, um, what other, rolfing, um, heller work. Like every system that was out there, I was willing to spend the money and the time to do whatever they told me because when you're when you have debilitating pain that you can't ever get away from, you're willing to do whatever it takes to get out of it. Mm -hmm. I was willing to pay whatever it took. I was willing to do whatever they told me. And they kept getting me an inch down the road, but they were calling it a mile. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I was very, very happy with what I was receiving from them because I didn't know that you could actually create instantaneous permanent change. And then one of my buddies I went to boarding school with, Kat from Philadelphia named Mark Persh he said, hey, I just saw this guy in Good Morning America. He's got some stretches and some things that I think would benefit you. And in my arrogance, I wrote back to him, dude, I'm good. I'm doing acupuncture, acupressure, Feldenkrais, the Gosku method. I'm mixing it all up. You know, I'm going to get down the road. And he said, okay. And then two weeks later, one of my clients called me. She said, hey, I just saw this good guy in Good Morning America. I said, oh my God, let me guess. He's got five stretches that'll change my life. And she was like, did you see the show? And I was like, no, but I'm getting the point. And I hunted the guy down and I spent two years training with him and he taught me a few things. And then at, some, at one point it was time to break my relationship with him and go on my own and figure out a way to do things that worked for me. And then I started to put all these pieces together that I felt were missing. And once I started to synthesize all these things together and a few of my other buddies, we were all investigating on how to put ourselves back together because we all had similar stories. And we would get together two or three days a week, four or five hours, and we would work on each other's bodies. Mm -hmm. And we created these really powerful systems that create instantaneous permanent change. And then I could never get the level of education that I wanted from the guy that started teaching me because my feeling is he was on the autistic spectrum and he was protecting information because he got all of his self-esteem from his knowledge. And so then I said, look, I'm going to go to Chinese medicine and study with them and then I'll get the deep knowledge. And that was my motivation. So was his method more like scratching the surface of this deeper knowledge? 
Yeah, I think for him, he had figured out, he had read some books on Chinese medicine. He had figured out some techniques that were really useful and helped me a lot. I mean, a lot. Yet to get to the deeper levels, I needed better positions and I needed more consistent force. And then me and my buddies figured out how to create these different positions. And to tell you the truth, when I showed up to get help from him initially, he had one system. By the time I left, he had another system because we were collectively building this thing together and his ego couldn't take that other people were adding so much value. It became um, an uncomfortable environment for him. And so he began to act out and lash out against a bunch of my friends. And so I decided to separate from that relationship. Mm -hmm. Wow. So then, then we found some really good tools and we put it all together and man, it works. Is that the true body intelligence now that, yeah, that's the true body intelligence. Yeah. What is that? What is that? Is it um, entail like different programs? Is that what? stretches like what is that i mean i'm not trying to like you know condense chinese medicine here but like okay yeah this is great so think about it like this uh imagine chinese medicine has a philosophy and the philosophy is very basic and it's really simple there's two forms of energy there's positive energy and there's negative energy and there's no scientist on the planet that will argue with that okay what they're saying in chinese medicine is that these channels of energy run through your body Most of them go up and down and the other ones go in a circle around you. And if you understand how energy moves and you can locate where it's stuck, you can remove that toxic load of what's causing that energy to be stuck. And now that energy will flow naturally. And when it flows naturally, you become inherently more intelligent. And so you're you're, uh, in true body intelligence. I've broken things down into four worlds, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, okay? In the body, every aspect of your physical being has a different form of intelligence within it. When you have an excessive amount of tension and stress and distortion, it keeps you from accessing the intelligence in that part of the body. And so then you become limited to move through the world by controlling your life with your mind. Well, when you get successful at controlling your life with your mind, you shut yourself off from your instinct, your emotions, and your energy. So true body intelligence is simple. It's true, okay, which means it's physical, it's intuitive, it's instinctive, it's, it's reflective, it's natural. It's in the body. Okay, so it's inherently physical. You're on a third dimensional plane and this world that we live in is physical. It's also energetic, but there's space and then there's density, okay? And then intelligence, the purpose of the work is to increase everyone's intelligence. Who doesn't wanna be more emotionally intelligent? If I could help you become more emotionally intelligent by simply taking tension out of your hip flexors, and suddenly you could communicate your emotions more effectively to your family and they could see who you really are and then feed you what it is you're really craving, your life would be better. If I could help you become more analytically intelligent and you could make better decisions, right? You could solve problems with more ease. You could be more authentically self-expressed. You could understand what people are attempting to teach you, what life's attempting to teach you. If I could increase your spiritual intelligence so you could easily be more ethical, uh, have better principles, uh, be more moral, um, be more integrous with your work, that would positively impact your life. And if I could increase your emotional intelligence, okay, I mean, your emotional intelligence, what would happen? You'd have more excitement for life. You'd be more free, you'd have more intimate experiences, Um, you'd you'd increase your level of self-care and you'd be more passionate. And so all of these forms of intelligence, they live in your body. I happen to know exactly where they live. 
and I have the tools to be able to activate them so you can access them and you can interfere with the patterns that you express every day that get in, in front of and interfere with your superior self. I like that. I like how you throw that in there. Um, because it's truth, right? Um, do you have to like work on them in any, any specific order, like physical first, then mental, then emotional, spiritual, or do you kind of intertwine them? I intertwine them relative to the person. So if someone were working with me privately versus their student that I'm teaching, the first thing that I do is a deep investigation. We're sitting down, we're having a hang for like two and a half, three hours. And I'm asking question after question after question, because when someone initially comes to work with me, they come, on, come in with an idea of why they're there. And then I need to know why they're really there. And so then I give a thorough investigation and I got to figure out what are your inner deficiencies? Like what's really missing? What are you really craving from life? And now they create a clear, specific intention based on the investigation. And that intention is the driver for what we're going to do on a physical level, for what we're going to do on an emotional level, for what we're going to do on an energetic level, for what we're going to do on a psychological level. And it's got to be intuitive, right? When I, when you, I mean, for me, the way that it works is as I learn a system, I apply the system to the thing that I'm doing and then the, so that I can learn the system. But then eventually that's not enough because every person you're working with is their own sovereign entity of energy and consciousness. So what is it that they really need? It's not up to me to decide that. It's up to them to generate initially their own intention for how they want to become their superior self. Mm -hmm. And then it's my job to then listen at an intuitive level and get out of God's way and let myself be inner directed rather than be outer reactive. It takes a lot of work though, to, to be in, in touch with that intuitive part of ourselves, right? Because you get a lot of um, hits, right? From that system. But if you don't trust it, right? Like if you don't work that, if you don't dive into that part of yourself, then it's tough. Like I, I find myself quite a bit, you know, have, you know, the gut instinct, right? The gut, the gut feeling on people, you know, right? Like, I really, I really am um, learning how to get in touch with that um, non-physical part of myself, that uh, the entity that being, that beingness that you're talking about, um, because we, we're so tied to this physical 3D reality with our, with our senses. We measure everything with our senses, our touch, feel, taste, smell, hearing, you know, like how often do we unless you're meditating every day, like how often are you really like shutting down everything and like feeling your environment and feeling yourself and receiving messages and intuition and insight. And then when you receive that insight, you're kind of questioning that. Um, I'm sure you went, I think it was like seven years of like working on yourself and going yeah. within. I yeah. mean, how long did it take you to find trust in what you were, you were receiving? Well, you know, what happened was this. I went to my four day process. I went through my first four day intensive. And then after the intensive, I went to the airport. And my experience of humans with me in public, whenever I was walking in a straight line, everyone simply got out of my way, okay? And when I went to the airport this time, after the removal of massive amounts of tension and all the pain being taken out of my joints, okay? When I went to the airport, Instead of people getting out of my way, they were bumping into me. And I'm looking around like, what's, <laughs> what's going on? Like, I feel like a bumper car, <laughs> okay? And I realized a day and a half later, what actually happened is I went from an assertive mode, right? From everything that I learned from SEAL training to shifting into a receptive mode. And when I was in a receptive mode, I was no longer in a protective mode. So no one needed to get out of my way. Mm -hmm. And so in retrospect, I was able to go, oh my goodness, not only did this have an effect on me physically, this changed the way that my environment is reading 
how to relate with me. And then I got on the plane and usually when I got on the plane and I would put my right arm on the armrest and my left arm on the armrest, uh, armrest, whoever was there, they moved their arms away. And then I sat down and I put my arm on the armrest and the guy pushed my arm off the armrest. And I was like, this is interesting. This has not been my experience. And so those kinds of things were markers for me to go, oh my goodness, something's changing energetically. Something's changing emotionally. Something's changing psychologically. And I was able to see those um, those shifts and those changes because I was self-aware, right? And as my self-awareness increased, right, it's called observer consciousness. So when you're in a state of fight or flight, your nervous system's in a state of hypervigilance, right? When you get out of fight or flight and you get into a flow state, you turn on what's called observer consciousness. And that means when I'm in an experience, I'm aware of the experience that I'm in, it's like being in the third person, but that person is outside of you and it, you're looking at yourself objectively and from a neutral position. So there's no judgment, right? There's no criticism. There's no disapproval. You're simply consciously observing yourself from the outside as you're interacting with this field of energy around you, which could be the grocery store or how I'm responding and behaving at, at a Philadelphia Eagles football game, or I'm watching the Sixers and the Lakers play. And so the key in this work in true body intelligence, and my goal for everybody that I work with is to shift them out of the post-traumatic stress that all humans are in into a state of neutrality so you can turn on their observer consciousness and turn off the hypervigilance. Because mm -hmm. once the hypervigilance is gone, you're now in a state of calm and peace at all times. What do you think the energy levels or the status of like the average guy going to work nine to five, like what do you think their energy, energy levels are doing? You know, if I were honest with you, uh, and honest to everybody who's going to uh, listening on the call uh, on the podcast, I would say that if 10 is your potential energy, the average human being is operating at about a 3.4. Mm, really? And that's average. Good athletes are operating at like maybe 4.5 if they're lucky. What, do, what level do you have to be at to manifest? To be able to manifest at will, mm -hmm. right, which means that I don't have to do any actual work to have the experience that's being called to me. I think once you get yourself in a state of neutrality, so think of being on earth as a human, an individual, right? And then you have a collective mind. So the individual would, would be I see, right, individual consciousness, and then the collective mind would be MC, which would be mass consciousness. So when you want to relate in terms of manifestation, when your nervous system is, is in a state of stillness, the collective mind and the collective will, it hears your request clearly. Hmm. When you're in chaos and you're in hypervigilance, the collective will can not hear your request because it doesn't live in chaos. So those two energies are diametrically opposed. So the first state is neutrality. Once you get to neutrality, you can start building greater levels of energy. Okay. I was no caffeine, no chocolate, no sugar. I mean, I had 10 years there where I slept three and a half to four hours a day. And I was rocking and rolling every single day, never skipping a step. Where were you living then? I was living in Marina del Rey. And that was because of your, your ability to um, generate or manifest more energy for yourself or raise those yeah. energy levels? Yeah. I raised my energy levels. I calmed my brain down. I got my body super comfortable. Uh, I got my emotions really grounded. And as you're doing these three, your energy levels rise up every single day. And they get higher and they get higher and they get higher. They're higher, but they're also calm. It's different than like if you were to take a stimulant and you have access to more energy. The problem is you have access to more what I would call buzz. 
Okay. So because you're in that state, your brain is now shifted into what's called a lateralized state of function. So you can no longer be in a flow state. You got a lot of energy, but you're not actually in a flow state, which means you got to struggle and strive in order to move forward. I created a path in true body intelligence where you can grow and move through forward through ease and grace. And the only thing you have to do is to take out generational stress, tension, and distortion that's trapped inside of your muscles and your fascia and your organs. And if you can do that successfully, your life is easy and full of grace. Is that through meditation, stretching, and input outputs of your body? I I mean, uh, in this path that I've created, uh, once you get to a state of neutrality, your, your brain is always in a meditative state. Are you in a, like, can you, can you access that at will? Yes. Hmm. So it's like hemisynchronization, right? Like when both hemispheres of the brain are in sync, in line, full brain. Yeah. Hmm. Then you're in whole brain thinking. It's like, we've seen it before. Kobe makes 80 right? Jordan makes 76 points. Okay. Like they, they can't miss a Steph Curry can't miss from the three point line. It's so easy to see when basketball players or football players are in a flow state, right? Running back runs for 276 yards. He usually averages 95, right? But for some reason that day he was in a flow state. So the thing is in true body intelligence and when you're building the superior, when we use that system to build the superior self, you can be in that flow state all the time. Okay. Like I work with, do uh, you follow wrestling? Uh, Which kind professional or like sport? (laughs) Uh, Sport, sport. So there's folk wrestling in college and the NCAA is in high school and you got senior wrestling, which is freestyle or Greco Roman. I'm a, I'm more of a professional wrestler, like NWO. Oh. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I wrestled in high school. I wrestled in okay. high school, middle school. Yeah. Okay, so wrestle, so so I work with I work with Penn State University. Okay, okay, and uh, it's a real benefit because I get to see the work that I do and the impact on them in terms of helping coach them to grow beyond their limitations, and they consistently, consistently win. Hmm. Right. They've gotten nine national championships in 11 years because the secret sauce that their coach has figured out, right, is he is in a flow state. How do we know he's in a flow state? He's the only undefeated wrestler in NCAA history and he's an Olympic champion. And as a coach, he's won nine national championships in 11 years. Like this guy lives in a flow state. That's so interesting because all the flow state research that I have read has to do with sports, right? Like Stephen Kotler, big fan of his work. Mika Ching, Ching, set me high, who is the grandfather of flow. Um, and a couple, Sue Jackson, who's in Australia. She does a lot of sports uh, psychology work with flow states. <clears throat> it all relates to sports, but how do you get into those flow states with, average dad you know three kids wife you know what i mean like what is that what what do flow states look like for the average trek so for the average um for the average guy and gal a flow state looks like i have an idea i sit down i talk with my wife and i say hey you know what I would love to go to Jamaica, babe. You know, we've been talking about this for years. Let's make it happen this year. I know the kids would love it. And she starts off with, okay, well, listen, the way we can do that is we can lower our data plans, okay? We can cut back here. We can cut back there. We can cut back here. And yeah, you can do that. You can struggle and strive that way. But when you're in a flow state, You simply are clear on what it is you want to do. And three months later, your neighbor knocks on your door and he goes, hey, guess what, Trey? Uh, Susie broke her leg at tennis. We can't go to Jamaica. Do you and your kids want to take the tickets? And you're like, well, well, you're going to have to let me give you something for them. Nah, don't 
Don't even worry about it. Yeah, come on over here. I'll take those tickets real quick. There you go. <laughs> right? You didn't have to work for them, right? You set clear intent. You knew what you wanted. You left enough space and it manifested. The way you get in that state is by simply removing the excessive, not the healthy, the excessive amount of tension and stress that's trapped in your body. It is the misnomer that's happening in all of sports and all of performance, whether you're a guitar player, whether you're a singer, whether you're a, a, a gymnast, okay? Whether you're taking a spelling bee, when you get people in whole brain thinking by getting their body out of massive amounts of tension and stress and distortion that have been passed on to them for generations, mm -hmm. okay? Every child that's born is born into a state of tension and stress. If you get your kids out of that state, their trajectory towards success changes dramatically. They move into exponential curve rather than a normal curve. Well, how do you pick up on that ancestry trauma, right? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you had a lot of trauma associated with yeah. your upbringing, but what, yeah. like one, two questions here. One, when did you know that it was trauma from your childhood? And two, when did you know it was from your mother, or your father's? So what happened for me is um, I was, what was I doing? I was taking stress and tension out of my kidney channel. Okay. As they refer to in Chinese medicine, they're called tendo muscular channels. Okay. And I was in this position, taking this out. And when it came out, I, I fell onto the ground. I started crying and I remembered and saw this vision of a dog that bit my face when I was seven and a half years old. Hmm. And at that moment, I understood that that created tension and stress and fear in my body. And what was interesting is whenever I would see dogs or, or I was out running and exercise, I run by, they always bark at me. So I was always, I, I, I was a little reticent around how I would approach a dog, right? I was apprehensive. And after I took that out, dogs, dogs don't bark at me. They never bark at me. Okay. I go over to someone's house for the first time that I'm just meeting. They're always like, Hey, listen, you know, I got one of those dogs. He's a little tiny dog, but he's really loud. He kind of snips and bites people. He's going to bark and get really loud. And, you know, I walk in or like my dog's sitting in your lap hmm. because that was an experience that I had as a child that was impacting me as an adult, the second I removed the fear out of my kidney, it changed my relationship with all dogs. Hmm. So when I get in the presence of a big, strong dog, they feel comfortable with me because I feel comfortable with them. And their barking was only exposing the fear that was inside of me. So once I understood that and I put that together, I said, oh my goodness, I started to see men and women who had been through intense levels of trauma and stress and trauma. And I started investigating and I found out that guess what? Their moms went through the same thing or their dads went through the same thing. And I said, well, ask your mom about this and let's talk tomorrow. And they would come in. I said, okay, so what did your mom tell you? Yes. Her mom went through the same thing. And not only did they go through the same thing, they went through the same thing at the same ages in exactly the same way. Hmm. so if you look into epigenetics and the study of epigenetics and i had the fortune of being able to investigate people and find these lines that were all connected and then once i removed that out of that woman or that man's body and they went back in to relate with their parents their relationship was on a whole nother level did you find trauma from your mother when she was a young girl? Say that again. Did you find trauma in your body from when your mother was a young girl? Yeah. Yeah. My mom went through some intense things too. Uh, where was the trauma? <clears throat> where was the trauma at from when you lost your mom? Where was that residing at? The trauma for when I lost my mom. Uh, let's see. I mourned. I didn't mourn my mother's death until I was 40, 
three years old. Really? Yeah. And what happened is I had a cat. She had kittens. And one of the kittens had a wasting away disease. And she died in my arms. And then when she died, suddenly I saw this image of my mother and I fell on the ground, heaving, crying for about 90 minutes. And I finally let that go. Hmm. Because I was young. I was seven years old. I'm in a, my mind is still in a precognitive state. I don't know how to process what's happening around me. I don't even truly understand the implication and the consequence of her choice. Okay. All I know at that time is I'm not trapped behind closed doors with someone who has border personality. I mean, that has borderline personality. I'm not trapped behind closed doors with them anymore. So in a, in a certain sense, I was relieved, but I, and the relief, because my nervous system was in a state of hypervigilance, overrode my ability to mourn, hmm. right? So imagine I'm 43 and I finally mourn my mother's death. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. I mean, <clears throat> Just healing alone is, is powerful. Can you look back on your life and be totally grateful for everything that's happened? Every single thing. Because I know I am the man that I am because of all of those experiences. And I would never change any of them. Hmm. Because I love the man that I am. And I would have never gotten here. Okay. The level of service that I pro provide for people, um, the level of connection, the level of hard work. To, like when I work with someone, I'm vested. Like I am totally vested in their growth because I understand the value of having solid support, love, care, affection, connection, inspiration, motivation, and now all the people that I serve powerfully, they motivate me constantly to become a better person. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to go? Like, where do I want to go? I think for me, the next move is generating enough resources so that I can build or co-create a privately endowed boarding school that funds itself and I teach 20 kids that are orphaned in some way. Um, and I'm able to take all of my wisdom and my knowledge, my energy, my consciousness and pass it off to them so that they could have a really powerful life. And if they choose to then forward that information and that knowledge, that would mean a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to build the school? You know, I mean, there's a part of me that would love to build it in the United States, but there's another part of me that would love to build it wherever someone would be willing to invest. Like if there's someone that tuned in this podcast and they lived in Romania and they were like, look, we will have you. Okay, where it's at doesn't matter to me. What matters to me most is that I find people who love and care about children and want to give them a great opportunity to grow. And I can pass this information, this love and this wisdom off to these kids because I know the world's going to be a better place. You take kids that are in the school and you educate them in this way from the time they're seven years old, imagine the amount of impact that they're going to be able to create by the time they're 20, 25, 26, 27 years old, where they've removed and transmuted a massive amount of their general generational, individual and familial and communal tension, stress and trauma. Like imagine free children moving through the world, creating and manifesting at will greater opportunities for other people who are trapped in patterns that keep them from being their superior self mm -hmm. can you start can you see the pieces start to line up for you for that yeah. as far as manifesting yeah. have you seen yeah. like now it's just kind of like i guess wait the waiting game right for it to yeah. actually manifest yeah yeah it's it's all it's only a matter of time it's only a matter of time um 
Why is that though? Is that because you're in that flow states or is it because you are that determined? I, what the way that I, the, the plan came to me when I first started doing this work, right? And I knew it was a 30 year plan and I'm, tw I'm 21 years in. Mm -hmm. So I knew that energetically I was going to be vested for 30 years. So is this plan from your higher self consciousness, yeah. like the universe telling you this? Yeah, I got a, I got a very strong download and it all made sense to me and it's <laughs> felt good ever since. And when I look back over my life, of course, these are the things that I want because these are the experiences that I, I went through. Like Milton Hershey School, think about Milton Hershey School. Like it's worth like what, 16.1 or $16.8 billion. And I look at the way that, uh, the amount of resources that they have. And I look and I think they have an opportunity to grow children in a way that would be super, super powerful. And if they had these tools, right, it would help them so much more. But the school is taking things in, in, in a different direction, mm -hmm. right? So I realized that, hey, I'll create a school if I can educate 20 kids a year for 15 or 20 years and create these really powerful lives, I'm going to be happy with that. Sure. I know that I am living my superior life when I get the opportunity to make that become manifest. Hmm. And I'm patient and I know everything is step by step and I'm ready to go when God is ready for that to happen. Well, my higher self is ready to, to, to take that next step. So well, how did you end up? I guess my question listening to that statement is I don't, I mean, I don't really know too much about that school or that boarding school. Right. Or, you know, I know where Hershey is. We go, we take the kids there. Um, how did you end up there instead of like, let's say an orphanage in Philly? Well, you know, there were, there were two choices, right? There was the orphanage in Philly or there was that place. And I remember my mom, my mom had crafted the plan before she died. And I remember she came to my room one night before I was going to sleep. And she was like, well, there's this place that you could go to school that I think would be really good for you. You'd have a TV in your own room and there'd be other kids to play with every day. And, da, 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 da. and I remember I was looking at her and I was like, what is she talking about? And then after she took her life and I was at Milton Hershey school, then I remembered that conversation. I was like, Oh, she was planning for me to go here. And she knew that if both parents were deceased, you would move up the list. And so she created that opportunity for me and my brother to go there at a very young age. How old your brother? My brother is four years younger than me. So he's 49. Do you think this was all planned for this, this higher purpose? I mean, for me, um, planned. I believe that every soul has a destiny. And I've always been able to see the signs in this synchronistic connections. And I've always used those as confirmation that I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And I remember asking God to make the sign so big and so loud that I would never be able to ignore them. What's the biggest sign that you, that you received that you could not ignore? Uh, the biggest sign that I've received that I couldn't ignore. Or was that, what was the point where you just knew? The point where I knew was this. I was coming back from Milton Hershey School, uh, wreck, in the afternoon. It was in the summertime. And the sun was behind me. And I saw my shadow. And I looked down. I was staring at my shadow while I was walking. And my shadow said to me, you're going to live a mystical life. Hmm. And I thought, at the time, what have I been? I would have been nine. And I thought, what's a mystical life? <laughs> I don't even know what the word mystical means. I would be like, who is that talking? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that's what happened. I ended up with a very mystical life. 
And I got my first confirmation when I was nine years old that that is what was going to be delivered to me. Are you helped by any ascended masters or higher archangel, archangel types? Like, do you communicate with that? Like at all? Yeah. yeah. The higher consciousness? Yeah, yeah for sure. 1000%. And so, there, so my guides are always putting the right people in front of me at the right moment and the right time. And so it's easy for me to trust because this has been going on for 44 years. It's going on like this for 44 years. Yeah, I, I'm, right I'm right there with you. I'm right there. I'm right there with you, man. Like you get it. It's, um, well, the synchronicities happen and science wants to say it's just by chance, right? It's not, it's not significant because it's just chance probability when it's not, it's, you know, it's looking at your watch and seeing a 444 every day for a week, you know, it's, it's, uh, meeting the, a person that, uh, you were just thinking about, right. It's, um, it's a little thing. It's subtle, right. You, it's but you, subtle. Have, you have to remember that you have to remember it. Like if you think this thought, if you say, man, is that a coincidence? It's the universe nudging you or pushing you or trying to get your attention. And it will continue to do that. It has done that in my life. I keep seeing numbers everywhere I go. License plates, time. You just said 44, 44 years. 44 is my number, right? Like it is, um, and you want to start um, uh, an orphanage or school, right? That's the same thing that I want to do. I want to be able to living in working in Baltimore and, and DC, I see children, you know, when I was working in Baltimore during the night shift, I would see children 10, 11 midnight, you know, seven, seven years old, six years old on the street. And it yeah. would break my heart because I had kids that age. I have kids that age. And like, so that's one thing that I want to achieve for myself at some point when I'm able to do that, when I'm able to manifest that for myself and for others is to have a place, a center for abandoned children. Yeah. You know, this is a, is this a coincidence? It's like you saying four, four, which that is my number that I constantly see. And then you're talking about a, a, uh, a center for orphans. Is it a synchronicity or is it the universe trying to bring Thanks that into reality i don't know you know that's that's what you have to figure out for yourself but in the same sense it's like it really makes you aware that we're there's so much more out there that we just don't fully comprehend yes yeah, like I, I call it the veil like um or the master weaver okay like here we are we're a collective will broken down into individual pieces and these pieces are they're interconnected mm -hmm. okay everything is connected what allows you to perceive that you and i are separate you know what allows you to perceive that the human eye only picks up 0.5 percent of the available light spectrum that's it we don't even get one percent of the available light spectrum we get 0.5%. What would happen if you saw the other 99.5%? Well, all you would see is white light. Mm -hmm. You would see that every single thing that you thought was separate is actually connected. So right now, um, you know, I'm struggling with a head cold or allergies, one of the two, or maybe COVID. I don't know, but not COVID, hopefully, but... Um, when I can kind of like sit down and like feel it, like, I, like if I can sit there and close my eyes and like really be aware in the moment, like it's this body, like the awareness isn't feeling any of this, right? The body's feeling it, but the awareness is just aware of it. That's you know? right. Like, so that, it was like fascinating to me because I've never really put myself in that position where, you know, I'm not going to say it's suffering, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable, but like people have that saying that metaphor of, you know, you can choose to suffer or whatever, you know, like suffering yeah. is what you choose, choose it to be. Like if you're in pain or, or something hurts, like you have the choice of in, to suffer in that essentially. 
So like, I'm just sitting here just kind of like meditating before the interview and just feeling like runny nose, headache, kind of, you know, that congestion. And then thinking to myself in that awareness, like I'm behind the, I'm behind that, right? Like I'm, the awareness is just aware of that going on in this body. Just fascinating. Like, you know, reality anyway, you know, like just, I, I think the important takeaway from a lot of what you said though, is that's your journey, that's your subjective perception of your reality. And a lot of people are quick. I I do it too. I fall into this all the time where I, I read a lot of literature on, on modalities that work for people, right. Or, um, their journeys and spiritual leaders and, what sometimes it's easy to fall into that trap of this is the way right i think your way is your experience and you you're continuously evolving down that path right that's right i constantly changing constantly that's consciousness consciousness is evolution of consciousness you know just like you're not the same person you were 10 years ago i'm not the same person that i was a week ago each day each day each new breath i am a new and my fear, well, I think a lot of people's fear is that they'll fall down this rabbit hole of like, what is truth, right? What is the answer for that, right? Like, what is your answer for them when they look at true body intelligence, when they hear your story, they hear your truth, right? Yeah. But how do you point them? How do you point them in the right direction to help find theirs, if that makes sense? Yeah, uh, when I'm working with people, most of the people who come to see me have had someone who they've talked to that I've helped co-create a miracle for them, okay? By biblical standards, like an authentic miracle. Okay? Like what? Like what? Like taking a person who arrives on a stretching board, a spine board, and two hours later, they walk out on their own. The guy that shows up and has been on, on a cane for 14 years and 50 minutes later, he throws his cane in the trash. Hmm. So, so these people are out in the world sharing their own intimate experiences. And because they're so real and so authentic to them, when someone finally comes to me, they're already ready, right? It's simply like, okay, when, where, Let's, let's, let's make it happen. I'm into it if you're into it. So for me, I deal with very little convincing. Mm. I have to spend next to no time doing that. And the benefit of what I do is I have a hundred thousand hours of practical research in personal and spiritual and physical development, which is more than any human alive. Mm -hmm. More than 10,000 hours. Yeah, I have 100,000. <laughs> okay. So if you look at mastery as 10,000 hours, times that by 10, right? That puts you in the state of what they would call a grandmaster. Okay. And so what a grandmaster understands is everyone has their own path. Okay. We cross over each other. What I have to share with you is what I experienced. And if it benefits your life, it's wonderful. It happens to be that it always benefits their life. And I teach all my practitioners, look, I'm teaching you a system. The system is not the thing. The thing is your love and your connection to God. Hmm. And your way to manipulate and make this your own thing. I hope when I meet you at Whole Foods 10 years from now, you don't tell me that you're doing exactly what I taught you. I hope you've taken all that information and that energy inside of you because everybody has their own healer inside of them. Every human is unique. I only create a system that allows them to carve out how unique they actually are and to shed their desire to over adjust and over adapt to the environments around them so they can actually become their authentic selves and experience truth and freedom 
of what's right for them. I'm so glad you're on the show because I have a question that I've been yearning for the answer or the right direction. Okay. Since you're trained in Eastern philosophy, right? Yeah. Is it wrong to desire, right? To create. You mean, to, you, 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 you mean lust or desire? Desire, right? Like to have um, a goal, but maybe that goal is not monetary. Maybe it's, maybe it's to be more, right? To mm -hmm. see the, the effects of your power, you know, that is in, within inside of us, our being, you know, our co-creation with God, our source, right? To okay. see this, this dream of whatever they may be, whether that's um, uh, a singer, artist, songwriter, mm -hmm. uh, what athlete, um, PhD, whatever. Is it, is it the desire for that wrong? Or is it because I get confused with like the, the Buddhist mindset of attachment, right? Non-attachment, attachment, and desire and non-desire. Yeah. So from your experience, right? Is it the desire that creates, or is it the non-attachment of that desire, but the thought that creates it? Um, that's a multi-dimensional question, right? <laughs> so, so it, it's it's very complex, right? Uh, is there a way to simplify it? Um, when desire is lustful meaning it causes you to break your inner sense of ethics, morals, values, and principles, and your own integrity, desire becomes chaotic and destructive, okay? If you are someone who needs to go through destruction in order to wake up into who it is you really are, it's okay. Yet, if you want to ride the middle ground of neutrality and you're tired of banging your head against the wall, then desiring from neutrality is very different because the, the place where you're desiring from changes, right? There's desiring from, I want to take, and then there's, there's desiring from, I want to give. Mm -hmm. And as you ascend, your desire changes to, I desire to share. And what I'm looking for in my share is environments where there's fair and equitable exchange. And when there's fair and equitable exchange of consciousness and love and care and affection and spaciousness, then guess what happens? It's a win, win, win for everybody. When I'm in a position of desiring to take it's usually unfair and inequitable. And unfair and inequitable desire is lustful and it leads to low functioning behavior. And that low functioning behavior creates a lot of chaos. So the position to look at is where are you desiring from? And if, if desiring to take leads you to be a better person, for instance, we could take the Will Smith experience, right? Recently, he desired to take. And in that exchange, he is now forced to wake up into a greater aspect of himself because no one is longer buying into his positive projection field and his image. They've seen the person that's dangerous that lives underneath, mm -hmm. okay? And now they can look at him objectively because they've seen both sides. I see that he's a loving guy, he's kind. I see that he's an angry guy and he's explosive. He's human, sure. right? So when we have these experiences that are, desirous, like he desired to win that trophy so much that he got so vested in his character that he lost an aspect of himself. Okay, so the end result of that is Will Smith will have less opportunities to impact 
children on the screen, in books, and in plays, because no one can unknow what they now know. It'll live forever. It'll live forever, right? Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about that is now all the other people who are in those positions get to start to question is, is the trophy worth it, right? He worked that hard for that many years up against a mountain of resistance. He finally won, okay? He could have won for two other roles. They Easily he could have won for those two other roles, okay? So when he finally got there, he was so fragmented that if every single thing wasn't perfect, he was crushed. And in his crushing moment, he decided to crush Chris Rock and hold him responsible for all of the pain and all of the suffering that he went through. So his lustful desire got him too fragmented and he lost too much of himself. Getting dark over there on the West Coast. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, sun, <laughs> the, the sun is setting. <laughs> well, Chris, uh, man, I could talk to you all night, dude. Um, dude we, 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 we can do it again, which is the good thing, right? Sure, sure. I've got um, so much knowledge and wisdom and love to share. And, you know, if you want me to help take people through like a powerful transmutative meditation that will help them deal with some of their fear and suffering, we can, we can do whatever you want. Yeah, we you got to utilize again. me as a tool and I will help the people that really appreciate and value what you do and bring to the world. Amazing. Uh, how can people find you though? How can they find out more about true body intelligence? I think the easiest way to find out about me on a personal level is to read the book Free for Life, A U.S. Navy SEAL's Unique Path to Inner Freedom and Outer Peace. If you want to learn about some of the systems where you can already start getting help, I've uploaded into a membership portal uh, a healing transmutative process for people that are suffering from pharmaceutical drugs, recreational drugs, the pandemic stress. Um, the daily drugs, sleep issues, sexual trauma and stress, I put really good programs that they can go through inside a portal that, that, that they can access. Mm. That will really help them. I, I put a little bit of education on the website about the system so they can get comfortable and start to research and, and understand um, and there's a website that you can access, you know, support at truebodyintelligence.com, send my assistant an email, something's going on, you're interested in moving to the next level. If I can help you support you, I will. But really the first step is to read the book. Because once you read the book, you're going to get a really great understanding that, oh my goodness. And then the last thing is I wrote an album it's music. There's eight songs on there. They're highly energetic, grounded, and spiritual, but they're also amazing music that is transformative all on its own. I love it. Make sure to pick up his book, Free for Life. Chris, my friend, thank you for joining <laughs> the show. Dude, it was great. It was great vibing with you. I, I love the natural flow. I wish more people who did podcasts could actually figure out how, how, how to do what you do naturally. 